Amen. Hallelujah. This today I got. Um, I want to share a word. Can go back unto the scriptures in Romans, talking about righteousness. Now we we talked about this a couple of weeks ago for a few weeks, talking about righteousness, and the word righteousness simply means to be in right standing with God, that you can stand before Him. Now, I don't know about you, but often when the presence of God begins to manifest, I I find myself on my face. So he's not necessarily just talking about you being able to stand on your feet. He's talking about that when He sees you, He doesn't see you as a worm. He doesn't see you as uh, some wretched sinner that's beyond redemption. He sees you with an everlasting love. The Bible says, and and it's very clear, John 3.16, God loves you. When He sees you, He loves you. But because of the sin that we were born into, remember, sin is not just something that you do, it is something that has afflicted mankind since Adam and Eve. Spiritually, sin is like having a disease in your DNA. You can't avoid it. It's part of your makeup. And your DNA spiritually, remember, you're not just a body that's walking around this earth. You are in a body. The real you is a spirit in a body with a soul, with a mind. That's where your mind, your will, and your emotions are. So, say this with me. I am... A spirit. A spirit. I have, I have a, mind. a mind. I live, I live in, a body. in a body. What happens when your body dies? Your spirit departs. Now you have hopefully made a choice in Christ so that when you die, and we are, it is appointed unto man wants to die, everyone in here is going to die. It's just going to happen. Now, God doesn't want it to happen. Death is the enemy of God. Now that's in the Bible. It's in Corinthians. Oh, death, where is thy sting? God hates death. Death came because of sin. Can you imagine the world like it is now where everyone, though, in their sinful state, in sinful mind, even the people that we would deem good, and the Bible says there's none good, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Listen, we're living below what God created us to live. And I'm not trying to give you a self-motivation speech so that you can live where God wants you to live. I'm telling you, you were born with a spiritual DNA defect called sin. It happened when Adam let the serpent have control. He did not what God said, you shall not eat of this tree lest you die. God warned him. Come on. Death wasn't God's punishment. Death was God's mercy so that the the planet would not be destroyed completely. Does that mean God brought death? No. God said, listen, i got to let this die out. But what happens now, because man in their spirit is separated from God because of the sin in their nature. Did you follow me? Are you with me? So because we were born and every human born on the planet has a sinful nature, we now have to have our nature changed and be born again. So our, our physical father, Adam, the beginning of the race, he allowed sin in and it corrupted everything. And since man was given charge over everything, everything under him became corrupted. The Bible says even the earth groans waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So God had to send somebody in the likeness of sinful man to become sin for them and pay the price of death for them so that they could have life instead. Now that's all Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The first five chapters of Romans talk about how in Adam, one person, all men after him die. But in Jesus, one person, men can be born again by faith in Christ. 
Now I'm not born of Adam anymore, but by faith in the, in the shed blood of the Son of the living God and His resurrection, when I make Him the Lord of my life, I become born over spiritually, and now all of a sudden the lights turn on and a relationship with God begins. That's what being born again means. I'm born out from sin again to God. I'm born over. The Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. Now this is just a review now. So Adam sinned and fell short and all men were subject to death. Subject to sin. Even on your best day, sin still is crouching in the corner. Come on. But in Christ, sin no longer has control over us. Amen. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a son of God. The Bible says in John the first chapter that He gave the right to be called the son, uh, a son of God, not the son, that's Him, a son, that's us, of God through Jesus. Jesus gave us His birthright. Come on. Jesus, born of a virgin, the eternal Word made flesh and dwelt among us as a human. Come on. Died as a human so that the penalty on, human, on, on humanity would be paid. And anyone that puts their faith in Him because it's not by works, least man should boast. Yeah, but God, I don't deserve to go to hell because of all the good things I've done. And God said, it's not about what you've done or haven't done. It's who you were. Amen. So now it's not about how much good you do for Christ and with Christ, and we should do good. It's about Christ still. After being born again and preaching for over 25 years, it's still based on Jesus, that I'm born again, saved, and going to heaven. Amen. Now, does that mean that I can just do whatever I want? No. That I can just go out there, hey, I received Jesus when I was four, and they sprinkled some water on me, so I'm going to go a whoring around. No. no, can't do it. No, nope. I'm going to become the biggest drug dealer because, hey, best life now. No. no. Romans continues on and tells us, because we've been given the grace to be born again and received it in Christ, how should we live? And most of the time, and I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as everyone else, we live one foot in and one foot out. We live struggling with the flesh and, 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 and wanting more of the things of God and wanting to know why we can't achieve them. Or even worse, we think we have to earn God's power in our lives by how much we confess a scripture, by how much we fast or pray. And God says, no, those things are good, but all they do is prepare you because I've already given you my power. Amen. Has the Holy Spirit been shed abroad upon all flesh? Amen. Has the day of Pentecost already come? Do, do those that work miracles among you work them by, by uh, the, the, the works of the flesh or by faith in in Christ. By faith in Christ. By the working of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that you feel as you begin to see and, 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 the, and feel the touch of God. When you walk into a place and you're, they're worshiping God and you feel that, that presence. Now, you might have something inwardly that doesn't like it, but that's why we cast it out. Amen. In Jesus' name. God was dealing, and this is going to be a message, but He said... Son, the devils knew I was the Son of God, and they screamed in terror. And I've made you a Son of God, so they should, they're terrified of you too. Amen. Amen. The devil is terrified of you. The only reason he has way, any way to do anything in your life as a born-again Christian is either ignorance or willfulness. Now, most people are ignorant. No one has to say amen. <laughs> but a lot of us are willful. Come on. And we like to dance on that line. Amen. 
How do we live a life that glorifies God for what He has done for us, making us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? How do we live a life that lives out the life of Christ in a sinful world? I am right standing before God. When God looks at me, He is not upset. He's not mad. He looks at me through the shed blood of Jesus and He sees me with mercy and grace and He knows everything about me. Isn't that amazing? He knows everything about me, Jack, but He still loves me. Oh my gosh. Come on now. And I'm not talking about just when I was a sinner and I didn't know better. I know better now and I've told God, shut up and let me alone. I want to do what I want to do. I have a feeling God doesn't have a lot of adults. He's got a lot of rebellious teenagers in the church. Amen? So how do I walk that out? How do I stay in that righteous place when I can't earn it, but I need to continue to keep it in the forefront of my mind so that when I'm faced with temptation, when I'm faced with doubt, when I'm faced with my own failings, I still trust in Christ. That's where we're going to pick up in Romans. So righteousness is right standing with God and only God can give it. You can't earn it. God is not paying you those wages. As a matter of fact, you earn death when you sin. The wages of sin is death. But now the free gift of God is salvation through Christ. And so now let's talk about how do we live dead to our sinful nature and alive to God. And we're going to go to Romans 6 and pick that up. Hallelujah. Romans 6, and we're going to pick it up. I'm going to skip around a little bit here, but we're going to stay really kind of tight with this this morning because I want to embed this deep into your heart. And it says um, in verse 1, Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that God's grace may abound? In other words, listen, we've been forgiven in Christ, so can I go live the life I want to? No. No, you cannot. By no means. Now this is in your Bible. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Do you know that's why we do water baptism? It is an outward act of faith that inside, in our spirit, we have been crucified with Christ, laid in the grave, and brought back out, and raised to new life. It's pretty simple, right? We were buried, therefore, verse 4, with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Well, how do I know that I've been born again? The Bible says in, in Romans 10 that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, How many of you believe that this morning? You believe Jesus has been raised from the dead? Then the Bible says all you have to do is confess Him as your Lord. You have to not just believe in your heart, you have to verbally say, I believe Jesus is Lord. That's why we have what we call altar calls. So that we have a, a, a formal time where people can confess Christ as their Lord and Savior. With your heart you believe to righteousness. With your mouth you confess unto salvation. That's Romans 10. Now here's the problem. What do we do after the altar call? Do we go back to our sinful ways? Do we go back to our sinful life? No. You should have an experience at that altar. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to have the same experience. Somebody over here may be crying and cry for hours. Somebody over here, the joy of the Lord may hit them. Somebody over here may fall out. Somebody over here may look like nothing happened, but something happened if they put their faith in Christ. I love what Rodney Howard Brown said. He said, if you walked out in that street and got hit by a Mack truck, you would know something happened. And salvation is a whole lot stronger than a Mack truck. When you get hit by Jesus and the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, you will know you got hit. 
God wants to give you an experience. He wants you not to just have a religious ceremony at an altar somewhere. He wants to slam into you with all of His love and all of His goodness and all of His life. Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly. He doesn't just come to say, well, we'll add you to our membership role. He wants you to live in newness of life. Chapter 6, verse 4. Now, verse 5. For if we have been united with Him in death. Do you see? Just the same way. I don't know who Adam is. I just know the name. I've read about him. Never met him. It was a long time ago. But he did something that he shouldn't have done and I've paid the price. Now listen, I have met Jesus. I know Him a little more every day. And I remember when I got hit by the Mack truck of His love. But I can honestly tell you that I have been united with Him in His crucifixion. I identified with Adam and his sin because I was a descendant of the sin. And now I identify with Jesus and his resurrection because I'm a descendant of the empty tomb. Are you with me? Barbara and I have been there in Israel where they say in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it is beautiful, and the power of God rocked us in that place. I'm telling you, it was awesome. When we stepped into that place where they say that it was the empty tomb... And you know, there's a lot of religious mess in, in Israel where they just claim it and it's tourist traps. But when we stepped in there and I said, Lord, if this is you, and I'm telling you the glory, we felt, I mean, it make you shake on the inside. And I knew this is it. I'm a descendant of that empty tomb. Amen. I used to be a descendant of Adam and his sin and his sinful ways, and I was trapped in death, but now I have newness of life. I'm released in resurrection in Christ. Hallelujah. Come on. People say, well, what is the hope that you have? I know, I, it's not just for His return. If His return is 10,000 years from now, I'm still alive forever in Christ. Amen. My body will die. One day, some of you in here may be at the funeral. Say nice things, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. But my spirit, man, the real me on the inside will live forever. And did I choose Christ or not will be the only thing that separates me to heaven or to hell. And listen, folks, I know they're out there preaching, saying that hell isn't real, but Jesus preached more on hell than He did on heaven. Why? Because He wanted to warn you. What do you think those guards are that come down and those bells and those lights when the train is coming? He wanted to warn you there's a train coming. There's a price to pay for sin. There's a price to pay for a life without God. There's a price to pay. If you stay in the way of Adam, you will die like Adam. Amen. Adam died, but there was so much life in him it took him 900 and some years. Whew. Now we're believing just for a hundred. Hallelujah. We've been blessed. We've had a lot of 90-year-olds in our group. Amen. Amen. Somebody can say, I receive it in Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so in, in, in chapter 6, if we have been united with Jesus in His death, we will certainly be united with Him in His resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. You see, here's the difference between a Christian and someone who's not a Christian. A Christian has been turned upside down. Or better yet, has been turned right side up. You are a spirit, you have a mind, and you live in a body. A sinner, their body tells them what to do. If it feels good, do it. Or we'll add, as long as I don't hurt anybody else. You are killing everyone around you when you sin. I don't care what the sin is. I don't care if it's a sin in private. It kills the wages of sin. Listen, it's going to be fun for a while. But payday's coming. A sinner lives body, mind, spirit. But a Christian lives spirit, a mind, and a body. Their body is put under. Their sinful desires have been crucified, buried with Christ. And now they are alive to live 
God is not a, a man that He should lie. He is a spirit. The Bible says that those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so God wants your spirit to be in communion with Him so that what He puts you on earth to do in the flesh becomes a work of God and not a work of yourself. Oh, I just said a thing. Hallelujah. And so what do I do? Because I still live in this body. I still have problems with this body. The Bible goes on to say that we should be a slave not to sin, but a slave to righteousness. We can become so filled with God and so righteous-minded that we are enslaved by it. It guides us in everything we do. When God says, go here, it doesn't even register that we wouldn't do it. God wants to guide your life. He wants you to hear His voice. He wants you to have what He wants you to have. He wants to be a blessing. The Bible said He would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So where is the key? If I used to be body first, then mind, then spirit, and now I'm spirit, mind, and body, what is the place where all of it rotates? Around the mind, right? So if my mind is wrong, I will stay upside down. But if my mind is right, come on, the battlefield, Joyce Myers, is in the mind. The mind that is set on God will allow you to serve God. A mind that is focused on the things of the flesh, even though you're a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, will eventually succumb to the flesh. Now let's go to Romans 7. Romans 7. And I'm going to read quite a bit of Scripture here. I need you to get it from the Scripture. Hallelujah. Romans 7. Let's see. Now this is Paul talking here. Paul the Apostle. He wrote... A lot of the New Testament. And this is what he has to say. Let's start maybe uh, around verse 14. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual. Talking about God's Word. But I am of the flesh. And I am sold under sin. Isn't that what I just said? Under Adam we were sold in sin. For I do not understand my own actions. Why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. I'll never forget I was on the bus as a five-year-old boy. And my best friend, some days, was a guy named Clint. And we were at the, and he lived up on a hill, and we came to a stop, and I think Roger was in between us. And Clint was running his mouth. And a voice came to me, punch him. I thought, good idea. So I reached over and I slugged him right in the mouth. And then we, were, we were right at the base of his house. I, anyway, he, I told him he was my best friend. So I slugged him and his tooth came out. And he started laughing. He said, we've been trying to get this tooth out forever. Well, that's not why I slugged him. I slugged him to shut him up because he was running his mouth. Sounds like what the devil does, doesn't it? That's how it works, folks. I can remember that voice throughout my life. Truth is, is it still tries to speak to me. Now you can say, well, get thee behind me, devil. And yeah, the devil does speak. But you know what? Your flesh speaks too. What do you think that appetite is? Come on. Carnal. That's carnal. The flesh. The pride of life. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. It's the voice of your flesh nature. But I'm crucified with Christ now. So what do I do? This is what Paul had to say. We were sold under sin. Verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. Why did I hit that boy? For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Clint was my best friend. You know how many sleepovers we had? He had these dogs, these... these, these, um, these uh, Bulldogs, they'd snore so loud I could not sleep. 
Hallelujah. And I remember that from five and I'm 50. For I do not do what I want, but do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. God's word is good. So, verse 17, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, I keep on doing it. Mm. The truth is, we think that people have to go away to some rehab for some really bad addiction. But the whole planet is a rehab. Uh Uh-oh, he just said it. I did. Verse 20, For now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Whew! It is no longer I, but sin that dwells in me. So God doesn't want to throw you away, but He wants to get the sin out of you so that it stops ruling your life. Do you understand why Jesus had to die so that you could die to that as well? He had to be crucified so that you could be crucified to the sinful nature. If He didn't have that experience, you would never have the experience. Because He wasn't born under sin. He was born of a virgin. He was born without Adam's spiritual breakdown. He was perfect And He lived without sin in a relationship with the Father and He showed us what that could be like on this planet. We say, well, He did miracles because He was the Son of God. Duh! You're the Son too through Him. Not Him. You're not Christ, but you're a Son of God, a child of God, a daughter of God. And you can have the miraculous. Everybody in here that's a part here, I'm telling you, you've seen God do miraculous things. Why? Because Jesus went to the cross and made a way for you to be a partaker of the divine nature. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? And that's in uh, 2 Peter, by the way. So, now, it is no longer I, but the sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law, a rule, a, a, a dictator, that when I want to do right, evil is close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. In my spirit, I want to serve God. I love it. I, I mean, I want to be with God. Hallelujah. That should be everybody in this place. But, verse 23, I see in my members my flesh, there is another dictator waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, my flesh. And this is Paul talking. He says in verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Whew! Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So if I serve the law of God with my mind, and my spirit wants to serve God, it's now two against one, isn't it? Why do we fast? Because God wants to see how hungry you'll be? No, because you're putting your fleshly appetites underneath your spirit. And that opens you up to the things of the spiritual Father, Father God, to be poured out through your spirit into this earth. Come on. You want to... I'll prove it to you. The Bible says for a married couple not to go separate from one another too long, lest the devil get in there physically talking about sex and, and, and cause temptation. Why? Unless you're fasting for a short time and then come back together. Why did he have to say that? I thought fasting was about food. No, fasting is about putting your carnal appetites underneath. Now, is food wrong? No. 
Is marriage wrong? No. But putting God first and drawing close to Him is why we fast. Because we're putting the flesh under. Now you couldn't do that until you were a Christian. You didn't have the opportunity until you believed on Christ. Are you still with me? We're going to go just a little bit further. Now we're over into eight. What do I do? My spirit wants to serve God. With my mind, I'm caught in between the battle. You know, the the cartoons love to have an angel on this side and an angel on that side, right? Now that's not how it happens. But we know the Holy Ghost in our spirit, He will say, don't do that. I told you he likes to play music to me. I'm like, whoa, boy, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to, okay, let's go over there. And he's like, nope. And all of a sudden, you know, I speak Jesus starts playing in my, in my head. Wasn't thinking it, wasn't nothing, and it comes up out of my spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, it, he's here. Don't do that. But there's another voice saying, wouldn't that look good to eat? Isn't that good? To be wise? Don't you want that fruit from that tree? Come on. Hallelujah. Now, there might be a thousand questions, but I'm just going to get to this one, one thing to answer. What do I do? And he says, thanks be to God through my Lord Jesus Christ. There is, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the spirit, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I want to tell you what that word law means. The rule, the dictator, the, 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 the rule of the spirit of life in Jesus has set you free from the rule of the flesh. You can put it this way. God's dominion in your life has set you free from Satan's dominion. His authority has broken the devil's authority in your life. Somebody say, I'm free. I'm free. In Jesus' name. name. Hallelujah. 4, verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sin sinful flesh, and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus had to die because He became sin for us who knew no sin that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. And because He died unlawfully, see the devil should have never had Him put to death because Jesus could not lawfully be kept in the grave because death had no legal right over Him because there was no true sin. So God put sin on Him, let Him be crucified. Come on. Jesus walked through every crowd. If He would have wanted to, those soldiers would have fallen flat. Pontius Pilate would have fallen flat. Caiaphas would have fallen flat. He could have disintegrated the whole place. He was the one holding their molecules together. But instead, He pays the price as the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world, so that sin in our lives could die. And He was not legally able to stay dead, so God was able to bring Him back, so that you and I, in Him, can be brought back to to life. That's the hope of our resurrection. Listen, they might take me out, but they can never stop my life. Come on, heaven is not just some sweet thing we talk about to make ourselves feel better with those that have passed before us. If they're in Christ, they're there in heaven. But guess what? If they're not in Christ, they're there eternally in a place that is not built for them. It was built for the devil and his angels, but because they've not chosen to be sided with God, God gave them what they wanted, an eternity has separated from Him. I know it sounds like 101, but listen, we've got to be reminded of this because the earth is not teaching Christ. It is teaching do what you want. Are you with me? Just a little further now. For God has done what the law could not do. In other words, He sent the law, thou shalt not, to show us that we couldn't keep it. But that, that doesn't sound fair. But by that law... He fulfilled the law when His Son kept the law. 
Hallelujah. Verse 4, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk, or that word could be live, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Just because you have the right in Christ to be right before God doesn't separate you from the, uh, the, the responsibility to walk right before God. Amen. Does that make sense? God loves you, so He took care of the things you couldn't take care of, but now He's empowered you to walk in front of Him in that power. So can I keep sinning because God's love is there? No, that's false teaching. It's what they call hyper-grace nowadays. My problem is, is now we'll probably swing back the other side because the, the body of Christ loves to live in a ditch. We don't like to live in the middle. We got opinions. <sighs> Opinions are the worst. Opinions take you to the left or the right. They never keep you in the balance of the truth. I don't have opinions. I have truth. Come on. And if my opinions are there, they should be based on the truth. And the truth is almost always down the middle. That's a hard thing to do. That is a hard thing to do because we were born with opinions. Sounds like we were born with sin too, right? For those, let's keep going in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We want to be, God wants to show how righteous He is in His his people, in in His children, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Folks, if you want to walk in the flesh, keep Seeing, reading, talking, thinking on fleshful things. But now let's see the other part of it. For those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now see, everybody in here today, and those of you that are watching by way of live stream, you are already ahead for the rest of this week because you are taking time to sow spiritual things into your mind so that you can agree with the Spirit, your Spirit agreed with Him, and do the things God wants you to do and not do the things that the devil wanted you to do. You will be empowered simply by coming into a place that has the, that is uh, according to God's Word, according to God's Spirit, according to God's presence. See, if you set your mind on spiritual things, you will have life. But if you set your mind, come on. Amen. When God calls you, and He did this week, thank you Janice for praying. When God calls you and says, come away with me. And you go, no, law and order's on. Come on. When God says, hey, let's get up and go fellowship with some saints today. And you go like, I don't feel like it. Feel, flesh, do what you want instead of what God said to do. Are you walking in what God paid for? No. Are you going to have difficulties? Yes. Can you turn it around? Absolutely. The Bible says over in the book of James that if we sin, we have an advocate. Jesus, the righteous. Woo, hallelujah. Jesus, if we come to Him and confess our sins, He is faithful and just. He will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But listen, the more you play, mind the things of the flesh, the more you mind the things of this world, the more the devil will have hold in your life. I just don't understand why I'm having so much turmoil. Yeah, but what have you been watching? What have you been listening to? Who have you been hanging out with? Listen, I know, God have mercy. I can tell you firsthand, you are always going to be held guilty by acquaintance. Yeah. Hallelujah. What happens if you get with like-minded people and they want to serve God? Isn't that what Paul said to do? Go find people of faith and stick with them. Be around them. But what if I don't have anybody? you got the Holy Ghost. He's with you everywhere you go. Hallelujah. 
I was with Papa Joe last night, and he was talking about you know, Elisha going into welding and all this stuff. And he said, well, he might be around some really rough characters, you know, and, and the stuff that they do in construction. And these guys, you know, they're just totally given over sometimes to the devil. He said, the best thing to do is ignore them. But what happens when you go party with them? Are you with me? Come on. The worst thing a young Christian can do is to go back and think he's going to win a bunch of people in the same bar he came out of. Right. You better not go. But if God sends you there, hallelujah. If God sends you there, you're going to walk in there and take people by the Spirit and pull them out. But He'll never do it until you're strong enough in your walk of righteousness with Him that the devil's pull doesn't have any pull on you. How do I set myself free? I choose the things of God. I put my mind on the things of God. So why do we do devotions? So God will be pleased with us? No, I do devotions to keep myself focused on the things of God. Because I know that there's a part of me that doesn't want Him. And until it dies, I, it doesn't have a rule over me. It can't tell me what to do unless I let it. Amen. And that's why he goes on to say in the book of Romans, which we're going to finish up now, he, he said, if you yield your flesh to be members of unrighteousness, to be a slave of unrighteousness. You see, no Christian can say the devil made me do it. You are either ignorant or you willfully allowed him. God is looking for a people that will still choose him over the fruit of the tree. And he's reset humankind through Jesus there is a group of people that can still choose to walk in the garden with him rather than to be cast out come on Amen. God is calling you to to obedience but not obedience so that you can be righteous you are righteous so that you can be obedient do you see the difference he's in other words I've gotten rid of the thing that makes you do what you do now you choose to do with me what you want he has still respected His creation so much that He's given you the choice, even as a born-again, Spirit-filled Christian, to live with Him or not. Because He is not somebody, He is just not that, that makes you do anything. Love always draws us to do it. Temptation always pushes us to do it. So you have to make a choice. Do I want to do the things of God? And if I do, then God help me put my mind on the things of God. How do I do that, Pastor? You give it in the Word of God. This Word is spiritual. It's not just a book written by old men. I'm telling you. I've read it cover to cover. I'm telling you, Jesus is in this book. God is in this book. This book changes you. Something happens, and it's not a religious epiphany. I mean, it goes inside of you sharper than any two-edged sword, cuts everything up, and then remakes it in the image of God. This book keeps you from sin. The more you're in this, the harder it is. I find myself repenting every time I open it. So what do I need to do? Put my mind in this book. What do I need to do? I need to be around people whose mind is on God rather than the things of this flesh. Well, I can't live outside of the world. I've got to go to work. I've I got people that are in my family. What do I do? I ignore the way they live and example the way He lives in me. Amen. And they're not going to like you for it because it's going to point out their wrongdoing. And it's not because I'm trying to condemn them or be more righteous than they are. I'm not righteous at all. My righteousness is of God. And so now I stand in front of you telling you by my lifestyle that your lifestyle might not be right, but it's not so that I can point out how wrong you are. It's to point out how good He is because I used to do that and He separated me from the consequences. Do you know we come from a family that is filled with bad consequences? Oh my gosh, the wages of sin is death. Why is my family so blessed? 
the goodness of God. We're no different, but we're blessed because He's taught us and we've yielded to walking with Him a little bit. And that's just a little bit. Could you imagine where we'd be if we'd really yielded? God, help me yield. Let's pray that together. Say, Father, Father help me, help me. Yield. yield. So now I'm dependent, and I'm going to say this and we'll close. I'm dependent not on myself, but I'm fully interdependent on Him to help me to live this Christian life. To help me to do the things God wants me to do. Amen. Now it's about Him and not about me. Do you see? It's about Jesus. Why do we sing to Him? Why do we praise Him? Because our minds need to be stayed on Him. Because it's all about Him. Amen. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Over and over throughout all of the, the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus, He pointed out how righteous they had to be. No one could do that. Why did He point it out? To prove that only He can do it. Amen. And He never proved it as in, look how righteous I am. No, He did it as a humble servant. And as a humble servant, He died on the cross to take sin out of its position of authority, to crucify the flesh, to cause those that would believe upon Him to be raised to newness of life so that we can now again of our own free will say yes to God. My question to you today, my question to you that are watching us by way of live stream, have you yielded your life to Christ yet? And once you yield, it's only the beginning. It takes a daily yielding to Christ. He makes you born again. Something changes you. The mass truck hits you. But then you have to say yes every day because the fruit is still in the middle of the garden. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today, if you've never yielded your heart to Christ, those of you that are in this place, if you've never re really truly yielded your heart to Christ... I don't care what you're in. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care where you've been. All that can only be fixed when you give your life to Him. Yes. You don't clean a fish before you catch it. You catch it, then you clean it. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that those that are here, hearing my voice, those that are listening by way of live stream, that Your love would begin to fall upon them. That Lord, that they would know that sin is a real thing and it causes eternal separation from You. But there is life through the shed blood of Christ. Through His death, burial, and resurrection, we come before You, believing in Him who paid the price for us. If that's you in, that, in this place, maybe you're, you fall into a, one of a, a different category. Maybe you've been born again, but you've, you've gotten out into sin and you need God to help clean you up and you're, you need to come back to Him. He said, I'll forgive you and I'll cleanse you and we'll start all over. We'll start all over. Maybe you're not sure of your salvation. Maybe you're in this place and say, you know, I've been to the altar two or three times, but I've never really had that Mack truck hit me. And I want God to show and show me forever and ever that I belong to Him. God will do it. He'll do it for you right now. And I want everybody in this place to bow your head and begin to pray with me in Jesus' name. I know that there are people watching us right now. And I want you to say this prayer with me. If you want Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead and you need to make Him the Lord of your life, you must confess it yourself. Say this prayer with me. All those that will join us, say, In Jesus' name, in Jesus name I, admit my sin, I admit my sin. And I ask You, Father, ask you, Father to forgive me of my sins and, of my sin. and to help me, to, help me to, serve to serve You and You alone. And you alone. Not by my strength, but with a mind filled with Christ. Father God, from this moment on, I make Jesus the Lord of my life. I no longer belong to Adam's sin. I'm born again to right standing with God. Jesus, You are my Lord. From this, from this moment on. And I ask you, and I ask you keep, me in your presence, keep me in your presence. Fill my mind, fill my mind with, spiritual things, with spiritual things to see you always. See you always. Satan, Satan, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name you, have no power over me. you have no power over 
I cast you out and break your authority in the name of Jesus who sets me free. Holy Spirit, fill me with the glory of God. Hit me with the Mack truck of your love. In Jesus' mighty name. Now come on and say thank you, Jesus. Thank you and praise you and glory to your name, Lord. You are worthy of all honor and glory and power and praise. Listen, I know that some of these things may seem like they're a little deep. But the truth is, we need to get back to preaching the depth of the tomb and the height, hallelujah, of the resurrection. People need to know it. Our children need to know it. Because everything is trying to cut it out of your mind. That's why the, the devil didn't go after the legislation first. He didn't go after even the churches first. He went after the schools. You see? Father, may there be teachers raised up in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank You for today. I thank You, Lord, that this Word is bound to us, that we're going to walk in life. And Lord, that we're going to lay aside every weight that so easily besets us. I don't know how to make everything right in my life, but I bring everything in my life to Your feet. You are the Lord now. It's all You. Teach me to, to live this life. Help me repent quick. Help me to walk in Your presence.